know, the time that we live in, the period of time, is really a time that could be marked by a time of confusion. And when you say that, that we are living in that area, it seems like there's confusion in every place that we live in. For example, it used to be that when you heard the national anthem that you stood at attention. But now we live in a time when that national anthem is played, we find people that kneel at the time of the national anthem. It's confusing times that we live in. Confusing for the generation of people that, that live in our day and age, it's confusing. At one time, if you went into a major department store and, and that you needed to use the restroom, you went into the restroom that was designated male or female, and you knew which one to go to based upon of what your birth certificate said that your gender was. But now one of the major department stores says that you can use either bathroom that you desire based upon your gender identity at the time that you need to use the restroom. How confusing is it in our day and time in which we live in? It really is a confusing time in which we live. At one time in my life that all 50 states said that it was illegal to possess to inhale, to smoke, to use marijuana. It was a federal offense. But now we find that states say that come to our state, that you can use it and that you won't be prosecuted. You can buy it in different forms of candy suckers or the real stuff to roll it, and it's okay. How confusing is that? that our national laws say that it's still illegal, but the state laws said it is legal to do. We live in terribly confusing times in which we live. But you know what? We as believers shouldn't add to that confusion. But the reality is, is that we as believers add to that confusion all the time in the world that we live in. Even though that we should not be a part of adding to the confusion, we find that we do add to the confusion as believers in this world. We add to it by living like the world. There's something still a part of our society which they believe that those who follow Jesus ought to be different. That we ought to act different, talk different, and live differently than those that are in the world. But when we live like those that are in the world, it creates confusion in the world. Because they say, I, I thought you were, and you went, and you're doing, it's so confusing to the world that is around. And the truth is, is that we need to make sure that we are living our faith out loud. And that as we live our faith out loud, we live it by living a holy life. And by living a holy life, we find that it does not add to the confusion to the world that we live in. You see, holiness, individual holiness in our lives, it, it erases the confusion because it identifies us and it marks us out clearly as being a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. So please, don't add to the confusion of the world. Live your faith out loud in holiness before the world and before the Lord. We're going to be reading this morning out of our text of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1, and we pick up in verse 14 as Peter challenges us of how to live our faith out loud before this world that we live in. Notice in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 14, 
Notice what it says. As obedient children, notice what he says, do not be conformed, do not be squeezed, do not be in the world's mode, he is saying, to that formal lust in which it was yours in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. If there's one thing that we know about the character of God, if there's one thing that we can say that we understand and affirm about God, here's what it is. We know that God is holy in his character. We see that all through the Bible, the, the holiness of God being demonstrated for us and helping us to understand some of what it means to worship a holy God. In the first few chapters in the book of Genesis, we find that after man has fallen and rebelled against God's wishes and desires and commands for man's life, we find that man at that time was removed from the garden. Man's rebellion, man's sin removed him from that perfect environment, took him out of that, and in that fellowship that was built into that garden, built into that relationship that man had, now that has been interrupted now by man's sin, and it all cries out that God is holy, and that man now is sinful. We find in the book of Leviticus, if you read that book, you can get really bogged down in all the, uh, the statutes and the commands that are there in the book of Leviticus. But the whole book of Leviticus can be summed up in these words. God is holy and God expects his people that worship him and follow him to work and to fellowship and to stand before him in holiness as well. We find in the book of Isaiah, that sixth chapter, that wonderful passage that is there, the seraphims, they cry out and say to God, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. But we find in other places like 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 2, it says, there is no one holy like the Lord cries out and saying, there, there is no one like you. You are holy. And then we find in Isaiah 40, 25, to whom then will you liken me, God is saying, that I would be equal, says the Holy One. And then Hosea 11, 9 says, the Holy One is in your midst. In Revelation, we find it, that theme running out through the scriptures that, that God is holy. Holy. We find the 24 elders, they, they cry out to the Lord, and he says, you're holy, holy, holy. I love the words of Johnny, Johnny Erickson Tata. She said, what a boring thing that would do. 24-7, and all you do is cry out, holy, holy is the Lord. And then she said, you know what, here's how I picture it. He said, they look up to the Lord, and they see Him in all of His holiness. And they just bow their heads, and they cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And, and they look up again, and and they see the Lord and they see a, a, like a diamond, a, a different aspect of the holiness of God. And they bow their heads again and they cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. And if there's one thing that we should leave with and understand in our hearts today is that our Lord, he is a holy, holy Holy God. 
How do you define his holiness? If we were to, to define it, if we were to, to encapsulate it, put it in a box, how would we define the holiness of God this morning? I love what John Piper said in these words he wrote. I think it would be biblically to say that the holiness of God is rooted exactly in God's inability to be defined. What is he saying? You can't define God's holiness. It is too wonderful, too great, too marvelous for us to put it into words and put God's holiness in a box. You can't do it. Listen to what he says again. I think it would be biblical to say that the holiness of God is rooted exactly in God's inability to be defined. What do we know about God of his holiness? We know that he's without sin. We know that he is pure. He's completely righteous. And we know that God was, is without equal. Because Isaiah 40, 25, write that verse down. Isaiah 40, 25 says, To whom then will you liken me that I should be his equal, says the Holy One. God said, who are you going to compare me with? Who are you going to match me up and say, I'm kind of like this? God is holy. And when we think and come into the presence of God, it ought to capture us. It ought to, in a sense, take our breath away when we begin to think of who God is. He is holy. And since we are his children, the children of God that have been saved by what he did for us on the cross, we are now then called to be holy like God is holy as well. You have been placed here on this earth to live out and to minister through the holiness of your life on this earth. And as we consider the holiness of God and our calling to be holy, there are three factors that we need to consider this morning. Three factors. But before we launch out into that and, and hurry past this idea, here's a question I want to ask you and ask myself. Do you really want to live your faith out loud? I mean, is that really the desire of your heart to live your faith out loud? Because you have to answer that. Because if it is your desire and is your passion to live your faith out loud, these three factors become important to your life. Consider these three factors. The first one is this. If you're going to live your faith out loud, you must consider the credibility factor. Look in your talk notes and write that down. You've got to consider the credibility factor. Listen to the words in verse 15 and 16 again. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourself also in all your behavior because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. Do you see your calling there? Do you see your calling in those verses? That you are to live a holy life that resembles, that reflects the holiness of God. Because what is at stake here is the credibility factor. Because if you're not living a holy life, you add to the confusion in this world and your life has no credibility. 
You say that you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. You say that you're a member of First Baptist Church, but if your life is lived like the world, you have no credibility. You are to live out your faith. You can say what you will, do what you will, but you have no credibility with the world unless you are living in relationship to your holy calling. That very word, that little word holy, might make you think that your calling is, is not for you, it's, it's for somebody else. But I want you to listen to the words of Chuck Colson when he said this. Chuck Colson writes and he says, when we think of holiness, great saints of the past like Francis of Assisi or George Mueller, they, they springs to mind. Or contemporary giants of the faith like Mother Teresa. But holiness is not a private presence of an elite core or martyrs or mystics and Nobel Prize winners. Holiness is the everyday business of every Christian, end of quote. You see, holiness is the call of God upon all of our lives. It's not for an elite group, a, a, a group that has been set aside, but he calls all of us to lead and live a holy life because the credibility factor is at stake. Is the world going to see you as an incredible witness for Christ? Or are they going to see you like you're just like everybody else? Or are they going to see that you really stand out and shine forth the holiness of God through your own life? The credibility factor is at work. If we were to define holiness and really strip it down, take all the bark, get right to the very essence of what holiness is, it would be defined this way. It really means separation. It means separation. If you're living a life like everyone else in Lamar County and nobody sees you as any different I can assure you that you're not living the holy life. If you're out drinking beer with your buddies and you're using the same language that everybody else is using and you're watching and going to the same places, listen, my friend, you are not living that separated life. You're not living a holy life. Holy means to separate, to live apart from the world. I want you to turn with me in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, points out the very things that we are to separate our lives from. I want you to notice these things in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. He begins this way, and he says, Do not love the world nor the things that are in the world. For if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father, listen, is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life, is not from the Father, but from the world. He says, do not love the world. What is he talking about when he says the world there? What is it referring to? He's talking about the world system, the world order that is being infused, guided, and led by Satan himself. That's what he's talking about. Don't love the world order. Don't love the things that Satan is inspiring in this world and directing in this world. Don't love those things, he's saying. But you are to separate yourself in three areas in this world. Three things, he says, he points out that we are to separate ourselves from. Notice what they are. The first one is this, the lust of the flesh. The lust of the flesh. 
That is that insatiable desire of the flesh to want the things that feels good to the flesh. Many times we think about sexual sins. That is true. Sexual sins feel good to the flesh. And he says that we are to separate ourselves from those sexual sins that God has prohibited. But it's more than that. It, it's whatever feels good. It could be eating into excess. It, it could be uh, exercising to an excess where it's unhealthy. He's talking about don't allow your flesh to control your life. Don't be led around like a zombie. Whatever your flesh wants, you go, you give into. It, it's a saying that this world has. Go for the gusto, right? You only live once. He's saying, look, separate yourself from that. Don't be guided, don't be enslaved to the flesh. Separate. And then second, he says that we are to separate not only from the lust of the flesh, but the lust of the eyes. Man, we live in a world that says, man, gain more. Man, I want that. I need that. I ought to have that. Man, that would look good over there. And man, to just consume, consume it more. That we're never satisfied. We're never content. We just live and are consumed by the world's things and goods in the world. We find it in the Bible, people that were caught up in the lust of the eyes. We find Lot's wife was. It led to her death. Achan was, when he saw the gold and the silver that was prohibited, he took it. It led to his death. David, when he saw Bathsheba, he saw it with his eyes. And he committed an act of immorality and it led to the death of their child that was conceived out of that relationship. And then he says, the third thing we're to separate ourselves from, and that is the boastful pride of life. Arrogance. Arrogance. That's what happened to Satan, wasn't it? Satan, an angel, one of the elite angels placed himself above God, demanded himself to be exalted above God, and it brought him down to the fall. We find that it is that arrogance that says in our lives that I have made and I have created, I have developed with my own ability, with my own hands, Pride could be defined this way. It's not recognizing or acknowledging that God has enabled you to have what you have in life. And he said it is in these three things that we ought to find ourselves separating ourselves from. We are to separate ourselves from the world and we are not to add to confusion to the world of telling the world that I'm a believer, but I'm not showing forth the holiness of God. So questions to ask yourself, are you, are you telling your flesh no? Are you ever, ever telling your eyes no? Don't glance there, don't stare in that direction. Are you telling your pride no? Are you burying your pride? It's all about a credibility. And I wonder today, if we could take a survey, put your name out in the community, my name out in the community, would people be confused that you are a believer in Christ? Would they say that you have no credibility in this community because you're not living your life out loud in holiness? When they see First Baptist outside these walls, are they seeing a credible people? Or are we just adding to the confusion that is already in this world? The first factor we must consider is the credibility factor. But there's a second factor we must consider, 
and that's the Christology factor. When we say that you're to separate, that's what holy means in its very essence of the word, that you are to separate. You must understand it's not only separating from things, but it's separating ourselves unto something or something. So it's not only just separating from some things in our lives, but it, it is separating ourselves to something. And what is that that we are to separate ourselves to? It is to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is Christ that we are to separate ourselves to in order that we might abide in him. And when we abide in him, notice what happens that we bear fruit in our lives. For John chapter 15 verse five says it this way, I am the vine, you are the branches. And he who abides in me and I in him, he bears, listen, much fruit. It's an interesting chapter, John 15. If you do a study on it, you'll find that he says that you'll bear more fruit, some fruit, and then it talks about bearing much fruit. And he wants us to, bury, uh, to bear much fruit in our lives. And what does that fruit look like? If somebody said, what is that fruit that you're talking about that should be in our lives when we are in Christ, separated from the things of the world, separated unto Christ, abiding in him, that we bear fruit, what does that fruit look like? You ready for a big theological jolt? Jesus. I mean, that's it. That fruit represents Jesus to this world. We find in Romans 8, 29, it says, For whom he has foreknown, he is also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. And what does that mean, to be like Jesus? They see Jesus. Well, Galatians 5, 22, 23, you know that famous passage, the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. That's what it means for you to live out your faith. You're to live in such a way that people can see Jesus in you. Pascal said it this way. The serene, silent beauty of a holy life is the most powerful influence in the world next to the might of the Spirit of God. He said the most powerful influence in the world is when people see your holy life of Christ living and working in you. When you show forth to the world your fruit that Christ bears in your life, that he produces in your life. When you show forth Christ in love and joy and peace and patience and kindness, when that is a evident in your life, you know what? People take notice and, and they see it in your life. It's the Christology factor in holiness that we must see. And there was an interesting story that John Stott wrote about. On May the 28th, 1972, the Duke of Windsor was died in Paris. His name was King Edward VIII. But it was interesting, in that very night that he died, on television, there was an interview done by him describing his life, and it was a question and answer time. And listen to these words, what he said. My father, the king, King George V, was a strict disciplinarian, he says. And sometimes when I had done something wrong, he would admonish me saying, my dear boy, you must always remember who you are. And my friend, we must always remember who we are in Christ that we are called to abide in him, to rest in him, that you and I might put forth in this world a holiness 
as we live out our lives, they might see Christ in our lives. But when you don't abide in Christ, you know what you do? You confuse people. Because there's fruit in your life, but sometimes it's hard to see it, isn't it? You have to dig for it. I mean, you've got to really shake the tree to find it. But it shouldn't be that way in your life. Because Christ's goodness and gentleness and love and patience and joy should overflow through your life as you rest and abide and fellowship and dine with Him every day of your life. See, there's three factors about holiness. The first one that we've mentioned is the credibility issue. The second was the Christology issue. And the third one I, that I want you to understand is the consistency factor. Sometimes when you hear the word holiness, you throw up your hands and you say, yeah, it's too late. I'm too old. It's for somebody else. I'm too far gone in the journey. It's not for my life. But I want you to notice verse 14 of what it says. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former loss which you are yours in your ignorance. Look what he says, the word conform. It's the same word that is used here that we find that is used by Peter. It is also used by Paul in Romans chapter 12, verse 2, when Paul writes and he said, don't be conformed to this world. The word conform is an interesting word, but what he's saying is don't allow the world to make you and put you in its mold. You live a holy life. And in order for you to live a holy life, here's the first thing that you've got to know and be encouraged by. The first one is this, to understand that holiness doesn't happen instantaneously in one's life. It's not like you just wake up one day and you are complete. It is something that happens in your life day by day by day. And so be encouraged that holiness is for you. It is for your life. And the Bible says that we are not to be conformed to this world. We are not to be made into this mode that we are to grow in holiness that breaks us out of that mode but it happens not instantaneously it's a lifelong journey and if you journal or if you look back across your life as you be a believer you ought to be able to look back and say man I have grown so well and so far in my growth but I know I have a long way to go but I've come such a long way already the first thing you need to know is that we just stay after it. It's something that we do consistently in our lives. It's something that we continue to work at. The word transformed, it's a word we get our word metamorphosis. It's a change that, that happens with inside of us. A change that happens with inside of us that, that it changes us from the inside out. And the moment that you're saved, that metamorphosis begins in your life through the Holy Spirit. And He begins to grow you into holiness. But there's three things that need to come about in your life for that to happen. The first one is this, is that you've got to turn away, separate you, yourself from the things of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of eyes, the boastful pride of life, we separate we separate ourselves unto Jesus. But Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, Therefore, he said, Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do we renew our mind? How do we get a new perspective? How do we get God's perspective of, of my situation? How do we have our minds renewed? It is by the Word of God. Consistently walking 
with the Lord by consistently turning away, turning unto Christ, and turning to the Word of God, then we grow in holiness. If you do not have your talk notes in your hand right now, I want you to find an offering envelope. I want you to find some lipstick, chapstick. I want you to find something. And I want you to write these six questions down that you can ask yourself. When you are faced with a decision, whether I should go left or right, straight or backwards, after you've already separated yourself from the world, separated yourself unto Christ, and after you have bathed your mind, renewed your mind in the Word of God, here are six questions you ought to be able to ask yourself. Here they go. The first one is this. Does this glorify God? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. Does it glorify God? That's where you ought to begin and say, if I do this, if I don't do this, does it bring glory to God? Ask yourself that. The second thing, question to ask yourself, is it consistent with the Lordship of Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 23. Is it consistent with the Lordship of Christ? Is this consistent with one that is allowing the Lord to be over his life? Is this step that I would take, is it consistent with the Lordship of Christ? The third question asks, is it consistent with biblical examples? Is it consistent with biblical examples? 1 Corinthians 11, 1. The fourth one. Is this lawful, beneficial for me, spiritually, mentally, physically? 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, 11 and 12. Is this lawful? Is it beneficial for me spiritually, mentally, and physically? The fifth question that you ask yourself, does this help others positively and not hurt others unnecessarily? Does this help others positively and not hurt others unnecessarily? 1 Corinthians 10, 33. 1 Corinthians 8, verse 13. The last question. Does this bring me under any enslaving power? Does this step, this decision, will it bring me under any enslaving power? 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 12. Listen to me. A life that makes a difference is a life that continues to strive after holiness in one's life. Those are the three factors that you need to consider in living a life of holiness. I love the words of Stephen Curtis Chapman. Many, many of you listen to him. On the radio, many of you have his music downloaded. One of his songs goes like this. Well, I've got myself a t-shirt that says, I believe. I've got letters on the back of my bracelet to serve as my ID. I got the necklace and I got the keychain. And I almost have everything a good Christian needs, yeah. I got the little Bible magnet on my refrigerator door and a welcome mat to bless you before you walk across my floor. I've got a Jesus bumper sticker and the outline of a fish stuck on the back of my car. And even though this stuff's all well and good, I can't but help ask myself, what about the change? What about the difference? What about the grace what about forgiveness? Listen, my friend. This world is already confused. It's already messed up. Please don't add to the confusion of the world. Live a holy life. 
before the world because your Lord is holy and he calls upon each and every one that names him as Lord to live out your faith out loud, backed up, not by your bumper stickers, not by your t-shirts, not by your cross necklaces, but backed up by your holy life.